in this next session, I'd like to discuss establishing the diagnosis of narcolepsy. How do we establish the diagnosis? What's the proper workup once we suspect it? And again, that, that, that mnemonic is critical, the chest mnemonic. Think about those four, uh, f five symptoms, I should say. And, and, and once you feel that narcolepsy may be, maybe something under differential diagnosis, then the first thing you really want to do is rule out other causes. There's so many other disorders. I think Jonathan really mentioned this very nicely. So many other disorders that could masquerade as narcolepsy. You want to rule those out to make sure that those are not the cause of some of the symptoms that you're, that you're looking at. And finally, of course, the, 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 the best way to establish the diagnosis is polysomnography followed by multiple sleep latency testing. So what, are, what, what, what should we look for in the clini clinical interview? Well, of course, direct observation for the patient, ask some very key questions, but I think Tom mentioned this earlier. Ask a family member. Sometimes the patient's not aware of falling asleep in, 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 at home, uh, spending all day napping. Sometimes patients are not aware that they're falling asleep in meetings. Sometimes they're not aware that they're having these subtle uh, manifestations of cataplexy, like a lid lag or clumsiness and so on. So ask a family member. You might also want to use some of these validated questionnaires, the Epper Sleepiness Scale, very commonly used. Don't be afraid to use it. Give it to patients. It's a very easy thing to fill out. It takes 30 seconds maximum for patients to fill it out. And finally, a good physical exam. If it has not been done, polysomnography and MSLT. We'll talk just a bit about that later. Uh, what blood test should you do? There's really no, uh, no consensus document on this, but I try to make sure over the past year or so, that patients have had a full battery of metabolic and other blood tests, and especially a TSH or thyroid function studies. The clinical interview, again, followed by screening, monitoring tools, and finally, the sleep laboratory. These are the three key air areas to establish a proper diagnosis. Now, let's talk about the diagnostic, uh, diagnostic criteria for narcolepsy. These are well described in the ICSD, or the International Classification of Sleep Disorders. And by the way, this classification system that we're looking at here will soon be modified to some extent as the ICSD-3 emerges over the next uh, few months. First of all, there has to be a complaint of excessive daytime sleepiness. And we talked about this a little bit. Excessive sleepiness can masquerade as fatigue and tiredness and so on but it's excessive daytime sleepiness is the sine qua non symptom of narcolepsy. And secondly, there must be a definite history of cataplexy. And again, we mentioned how subtle of a symptom that could be and how important it is for you to actively elicit cataplexy because it could be subtle, it could be partial. And finally, multiple sleep latency testing. Uh, an MSLT is basically a nap test where individuals are, are asked to take naps at certain points during the course of the day. And a MSLT mean score of less than eight, or if it takes them less than eight minutes to fall asleep, and if they have two or more sleep onset REM episodes during these naps, those that type of finding is considered to be very, very specific for narcolepsy. Uh, of course, hypersomnia should not be better explained by other symptoms. The, these are the, those were the criteria for narcolepsy with cataplexy. Now, some people have narcolepsy without cataplexy. The diagnostic features are identical in many ways, except, of course, that patients don't have cataplexy. There is no complaint of cataplexy. But the polysomnographic and MSLT findings are exactly identical in narcolepsy without cataplexy. Now, let's talk a bit about the polysomnographic test. Polysomnography, as many of you know, is the uh, monitoring of multiple physiologic measures during sleep. And uh, this should be always performed prior to a daytime multiple sleep latency test. Why? Well, you want to make sure you rule out sleep apnea, other causes for daytime sleepiness, like periodic limb movements in sleep. And you want to make sure that the patient is not sleep deprived. During this uh, test, the polysomnographic test, you really want to see about six hours or more of sleep to be able to ensure that sleep deprivation is not the cause of, or, of, of the daytime symptomatology or daytime findings on multiple sleep latency testing. Uh, the multiple sleep latency test, uh, this, was a, this is a test which is used almost exclusively for the diagnosis of narcolepsy. Uh, there are many guidelines for this test which are well described in the standards of, by the Standards of Practice Committee of the American Academy of Sleep Medicine. But basically, uh, it's a test which is performed during the course of the day in many sleep laboratories or sleep disorder centers. Patients are asked to fall asleep or not resist the urge to fall asleep during five different nap opportunities during the course of the day. Uh, before the test, of course, patients should avoid caffeinated beverages. They should avoid bright light because these could 
produce false, neg false negative findings during the polysomnographic test with the MSLT. They should stop taking stimulants and other medications prior to these nap opportunities, although Jonathan and Tom, as many of us know, it's sometimes very difficult to take patients off of these medications before the test, so we have to use some clinical judgment there. Uh, it has to be performed by experienced technicians and, of course, in accredited centers. Uh, multiple sleep latency testing, the opportunity to nap is about 20 minutes, so patients are allowed to stay in bed for 20 minutes. And if they do fall asleep within that 20-minute period of time, then they're allowed an additional 15 minutes to be able to exempt, to be able to manifest REM sleep. So the test is concluded in 20 minutes if no sleep occurs. But if sleep does occur, that test is extended for another 15 minutes to be able to allow for REM sleep. And again, we're looking for REM sleep or sleep onset REM episodes during this test. Um, uh, the multiple sleep latency test is a very sensitive test, as I mentioned before, and it should always be done for the diagnosis of narcolepsy, at least in this day and age. So uh, in summary, what have I said today? Well, number one, for patients with excessive sleepiness, think about narcolepsy. Excessive sleepiness can be caused by many different disorders, but certainly think about the possibility of narcolepsy. And really a full clinical interview is essential. The things we normally do as physicians, a history, physical examination, blood tests, and so on. Use the Epworth. It's a validated inventory, easy to use, quick, very, very sensitive. For patients with excessive sleepiness and a clear history of cataplexy, you should really consider doing a polysomnogram followed by multiple sleep latency testing. That's really the state of the art in the diagnosis of narcolepsy. And for patients with excessive sleepiness without cataplexy, possibly, again, polysomnography followed by MSLT may be a good idea to do to be able to establish the diagnosis.